This isn't much of a horror story, but it's pretty funny and deserves to be shared. I'm running a heavily homebrewed version of Tomb of Annihilation for two new players. We started with a couple of one-shots before starting this campaign. One of my players knows a fair bit about D&D, through podcasts mostly. The other has barely even heard about it before we started. We're about three months in, and the less experienced player has just told me they've accidentally been using a d20 for all their damage rolls. We play pretty fast and loose with rules, and I'm generous with magic items and started at second level and now we're fifth, so their rolls never seemed unusual to me. A little higher than I expect, but nothing crazy. We play online and don't use roll 20 or anything like that, so it wouldn't let me see their rolls, so I never even realized. The player realized it luckily and just told me. We're all close friends and this is a very casual game, so I'm not upset, but I do want to mess with them a bit. If anyone has suggestions, I'd love to hear them. I don't really have any suggestions on the messing with them part, but I will say that maybe we should have a little bit more clarification as DMs where we say stuff like, you use the D20 in order to do anything. Some people might take it a little bit more literally than others. So this happened a week or so ago, we played a one-shot online with level 14 characters. We had agreed with the DM, optimization was fully on the table. I turned up with a Valor Bard that mostly supported our frontliners. The problem player was our Lockadin, a warlock slash paladin. The whole point of his character was fishing for critical hits and then using an Eldritch Smite and Divine Smite to dish out huge damage. The DM had laid out an extensive dungeon for us to rip and tear through. It soon became apparent he felt obliged to tell us exactly what to do. When an enemy missed he stepped away from him, he told the DM he won to attack because he had sentinel. After being told he couldn't because it was a teleport, not movement, he sneered at me. Well, OP, counterspell it. I told him he wasn't going to kill it next round anyway, so it wasn't worth it. Alright, I thought you play a support character, but fine. Here is the kicker. Once we arrived at the boss fight, some kind of devil, this guy still hadn't really gotten to show off his smiting potential. Therefore, I teleported into the enemy's reach and used the help action on the paladin to attack the devil, in addition to giving him inspiration. I then stepped back and described how I taunted the devil only to drop my sword and hold out my hands, stepping backwards to provoke an attack of opportunity whilst winking at the paladin. Oh, do I get to make an attack? He rolled. Nat. 20. The DM described how my risky play allowed the paladin to carve the fiend in two with the power of heaven and hell. I was overjoyed as I managed to do exactly what I wanted, help other people play their character as the epic hero they imagined. Does my sword carve through OP's character as well? The paladin asks. The DM looks confused. I look dumbfounded. Uh, no, why would it? The paladin sighed and in character he grumbled at me not to get in the way of his monster killing. We ended the session pretty soon afterwards, but the following day, I woke up to a bunch of text messages that I hogged the spotlight and made my character look like a for relying on your character. I know for certain I was not going to be playing with that group again, which is a shame because the DM is awesome. TLDR, I used the help action to let someone finish the fight and I got accused of spotlight hogging for it. This is a short one, but damn it, it is a bit frustrating. Helping other people in the party is an awesome part of Dungeons & Dragons. It's amazing, especially in really difficult combats. I'm assuming because optimization was on the table, combat in this game was really, really deadly and really, really hard. So helping others would be necessary. Strategizing together is part of what makes D&D so much fun. Using your abilities in tandem, feeling like the damn Avengers, that is some of my favorite moments in D&D. And yelling at someone because they helped you kill the bad guy is some logical acrobatics for the ages. I don't think I really need to go in depth on why this is stupid. The stupidity is pretty self-evident. <laughs> I was GMing a game of Cthulhu Tech for friends. If you ever heard of it, it's basically a horribly flawed and unpopular system. But we love the setting, and we love the game. The game is set in a war-torn cyberpunk future where Lovecraft monsters, cults, and magic exist alongside mecha, starships, and cybernetics. And at this particular point in the campaign, the party was following leads on a cult, hiding out in a now nuclear wasteland that used to be the Amazon rainforest. On their way there, the helicopter they've taken to survey the area is shot down by rockets, and it crashed land in the forest. At this point, we had been playing for months, but my good friend in the group told me he had a friend who was interested in joining 
and thought it would be easy enough introducing him, so I allowed him to join. The party survived the crash alongside their newest member who took the place of the nameless helicopter pilot provided to them by the guild, banged up, dangerously low in supplies and ammunition, but alive. After the party salvages what they can from the wreck, the forest is eerily quiet, and an uneasiness fills the air. In the distance, colossal footsteps are heard, cracking the earth, with a low supernatural hum bellowing. The party springs into action, activating defensive abilities and stealth, trying to gain a better vantage at the unearthly horror that's approaching all too quickly. The technical officer is the first unfortunate soul to lay eyes on the abomination. A 40 meter tall hulking mass of tumors, eyeballs, and overgrown roots hobbles through the forest, seeming to be drawn to the side of the crash. The technical officer nearly faints at the sight of it, and Whisper yells to the party what he sees. Immediately, the party does their very best to, you know, hide, stay silent, and avoid so much as looking at the monster. All but the new guy. New Guy takes cover, but does not use any of the provided opportunities to hide, despite the advice of the party, and clearly painted circumstance in front of him. As the monster draws near enough, New Guy makes no attempt to avoid its gaze. Again, despite the direct advice of the entire party in unison and very intentionally deterring language by the DM. By some miracle, he rolls nearly perfectly and does not suffer the effects of fear or insanity. To him, the lights could not be any brighter shade of green, so he does what any sensible player would do. He draws his 9mm pistol, lets out a fierce battle cry, and fires into the beast's leg. On a side note, in this system, there are two damage scales, vitality and integrity. Vitality is the scale used between humans and small monsters. It's your very standard damage. Integrity, on the other hand, is the scale used by colossal Lovecraftian whores, Mecha, and ships. One point of integrity, health, or damage is equal to 50 points of vitality, health, or damage. The strongest human might have around 80 vitality points, so a single roll of a 2 on the game's many d10s would instantly kill virtually anyone. It is a horror setting, and the enemy was intended for the party to work up to salvaging a mech to battle, but, you know, back to new guy. Shots were fired, and the party was in plain disbelief at what just transpired, out of game asking him what the hell he was doing and making extra sure he understood that this was not a game about winning every fight. He then explained the difference in the damage scales to our entire group in perfect detail, conveying that he knew exactly how the numbers would work in the situation, and reiterated that his actions were deliberate and informed. As the GM, I gave him one final attempt to salvage the situation by playing at the creature's low intelligence and pointing out a lovely hiding spot within diving distance to where he was. His turn comes again, and there was still ammo in his pistol. He fired three more shots, burning as many bonus dice as he had. The rest of the party dared not move or give away their location, still in hysterics at this guy out of game. The monster lifted one massive knotted foot into the air, temporarily occupied new guy's hex, and when its foot came down again, there was no longer a new guy in the hex. The player quit the group on the spot in a huff, never spoke to his friend who invited him into the group again, and talked the meanest shit about us and our game to anyone who would hear it. What kind of game is it if you can't even kill the enemies? The part that dumbfounded me was how well he clearly understood the rules and the situation he was in, and still chose a completely idiotic action. The party told him a hundred times he was doing something stupid, and I gave him many chances, as many as I could, without just plot armoring him. Could I have modified the encounter to save him? Yeah, probably, but everyone was enjoying a gritty, difficult campaign, and I wasn't going to throw that out for a friend of a friend. In retrospect, I know I could have just said, no, you don't do that, but I was very young and very much a fan of every action is available along with its consequence style of GMing. Moral of the story, be careful letting people you don't know into games you and your friends put a lot of time and effort into. I do understand the OP's trepidation with how this all turned out, but honestly, the OP gave that guy plenty of chances to get out of this situation. He had ample opportunities to just hide like every other member of the party and not do something completely idiotic, but instead he actively chose to make the stupid decision. And while yes, the GM in theory could have forced him to make the smart move, I think that would have incurred a hostile response anyway, and it would have been pointless in retrospect. This is exactly what Session Zero is meant to prevent. Session Zero is by no means a bullet for every single problem in D&D and in TTRPGs as a whole. However, it does solve stuff like this, at least in theory. If they had talked about this, they could have explained to the guy that, look, you're not going to be winning every fight. There are going to be times where you need to smartly retreat or hide from monsters that are far beyond 
your capabilities, and if the guy wasn't into that, he would just have not joined the game. Though, like the OP said, the guy clearly understood the vibe and the rules of the system, so maybe he was just a complete idiot. At this point, I have no idea. I live in Chicago. We have a bar for just about any walk of life here in this big city of Midwestern values. My walk of life mostly incorporates TTRPGs, heavy metal, cold laggers, and cheese curds. So when I stumbled across a bar that specializes in all of the above, I instantly fell in love. The space is truly exceptional. They have a large but relatively private game room separated from the bar by a long hallway. Brutalist fantasy decor, vintage video games, great music, cheap lagers with food specialization in donor bowls and poutine, paradise. The first time I stumbled across this place, I noticed the game room and a handcrafted beholder beer bong hanging from the ceiling. I asked the bartender if they had D&D games that I could attend as either a player or a DM. They directed me to a Facebook group where they organized their events. This group has been meeting every Wednesday at 7.30. I dusted off the old Facebook app and started drafting a post. Hey, new to this community? I am a very experienced DM and I am looking to run a D&D 5th edition one-shot on this day at this bar. The one-shot is designed to incorporate a tarot card reading system and the party goes on a journey that fulfills the fortune of the cards. Let me know if you're interested. The post got a lot of likes and comments from interested players, but after a few hours, I received a comment from the admin. Let's call him Gob. Sorry to burst your bubble, but this group is for already organized games hosted by myself and the other guy. We have the back room reserved and usually fill up all the available seats we can without too much noise or pollution slash overcrowding. We have been staying away from 5th edition after running at the bar for 4 years and we've moved on to DCC, Dungeon Crawl Classics. DCC in my opinion is far more suited for a bar game and much easier to learn for newcomers, as well as much less toxic in community and company and also the inability to power game is a big plus for the system, aka get that 5th edition shit out of here please. I'm just kidding, but for real, no thanks. Now, if you would like to talk to the bar and schedule another day or maybe play in the front separate, you're more than welcome. Alternatively, you could join us on Wednesday and check out what we do before starting a whole new thing. Post was locked and comments were turned off. A little off-putting, condescending and judgmental, but whatever. It's a Facebook post. A few days go by and I decide to join them the following Wednesday. When I get to the table, the vibe is cold. Gob does not really engage when I tried to make some pre-game small talk. I tried asking questions about DCC, a system I was largely unfamiliar with, and they just tossed a book at me and said, look it up. I spent the rest of the pre-game reading about my class, looking up basic rules, and trying to figure out the best way to stay alive in such a meat grinder system. Everything but my class was randomly generated. The background I got was Farmer, so I had a pet pig with me. I named her Tulip and made my character very much a love this pig like a child type. The DM then started calling me Pig and the party started chiming in. Alright, whatever. Although mean-spirited, it's still pretty funny? I just rolled it into my character interactions with my dwarf named Ingot, being all too familiar with other dwarves not understanding the innocent bond he has with his sweet Tulip. Just like his dad, forcing him to be a miner, not understanding his passion for raising these wonderful creatures. As the game went on, Tulip was used to good effect, scouting ahead, creating distractions, and generally being an asset to the party. We got to the point where we saw a cliff face, nothing but a rope attached to it, with broken lift. Ingot, my dwarf, volunteered to go scout ahead and rappel down the rope. Before he left, he said, If anything happens to me down there, be sure to take care of Tulip for me. They responded with apathy about the pig. As Ingot started descending, he sees a pink burl careening towards him. It was Tulip! He dropped his longsword to free up an arm to attempt to catch the pig. Roll failed. Tulip falls to her death. The party had tossed the pig off the edge for no other reason than to be a dick. Now look, I don't like to get upset about things that happened in an imaginary world, but I couldn't help but feel like this was an attack on me, the player. It was pointless, and it was very mean. Narratively, it has left me no choice but to retaliate. This is not something Ingot would just ignore and shrug off. Ingot starts climbing back up with an intensity behind his eyes that burns hotter than his compassion for his blessed pig. Ingot was a level 1. Most of the party were level 3+. plus. The culprit behind the slaughter was a wizard. I did not know much about this game, but what I did know was that at level 1, I can choose the shove ability. On a successful roll, it moves any creature 10 feet in a chosen direction. The wizard just so happened to be standing on the cliff face. The sound of the pig's corpse slamming against the cold hard floor had woken what seemed to be a massive insect. My character did not care. He has tunnel vision. He needs to avenge his pig. Ingot reaches the top of the cliff face with the insect hot on his tail. He begins to shove the wizard towards the cliff. 
a success, but still five feet to go, and the wizard cast darkness. Now, I wish I could tell you this ends in Ingot trifling with a level four wizard and avenging his poor tulip, but the DM just wouldn't let this work. We fought off the insect, and then after the battle, wizard casts a calming spell on me, since if I kept shoving him, we would TPK, and some people have characters that they have been working on for months. So I decided to go out of my character and back off, at least until we kill this big bug. After we kill this bug, the calm spell is used again. The only way forward was down that cliffside. I was pretty checked out at this point, so both Ingot and I were pretty absent from the following roleplay. The wizard decides to make his way down the rope. Another player seemed to empathize with me. It was pretty apparent that all my fun got taken away. She found an opportunity to kill the wizard and took it. She cut the rope, you know, the one the wizard was descending down. The session kind of ended soon after that since the player was pretty upset. I realized this group was not for me, so I decided to take Gob's advice and started my own D&D night for Tuesdays. I asked Gob if I could post on his Facebook page in a private message, and he responded, Please make another group. I reserve that group for Wednesday events. Sorry. Damn, well, okay. I guess I'll do that then. Unnecessary. I spun up some ads, started a Discord server, and began promoting the games and the server on various Facebook groups for local D&D meetups as well as neighborhood pages. I got a lot of interest and started getting more players. Even some people who had tried the Wednesday night group and had bad experiences with them showed up to my game. Our first night, we had a turnout of about 10 people. It was a big success. After a few weeks of running my games, I reached out to Gob and asked him if he wanted to join my server so he could have a space to promote his games to my new audience. After all, a rising tide floats all ships. He joined, and I created a space for him to talk about his DCC games. I asked him to come by and play in one of my games, and he declined. We had been growing so much that I needed a second DM to host a second table. I asked Gob if he would like to lend a hand, and he declined again. I gave the responsibility to a former Wednesday night player. We can call him James. Oddly enough, Gob started showing up and playing in his games. Every once in a while, we did a special night where instead of one-shots, we do continuing storylines of some 5th edition adventures in Ravenloft. DM'd by James. In this campaign, I played a war cleric with great weapon fighter, basically a different kind of paladin with more of a focus on mixing martial, ranged spell attack, status magic, and of course, powerful healing. His whole shtick was that his church was basically an MLM. People generally got a really good laugh out of it. Gob, on the other hand, he did not. He constantly criticized me for not playing my character like a cleric. How I should be saving my spell slots for buffs instead of using Guiding Bolt. He continued to ridicule me about the game on my Discord server. I clapped back a few times, but just let it be. It's all just imaginary shit. At this point, I have been running games at the bar on Tuesdays for about 10 months. Stranger Things Season 4 just came out. We have seen a massive boon in new players. We went from around two tables of four players to two tables of seven or eight players. It got me thinking. I have enough players to get shirts printed up. As soon as I announce the shirts, Gob announces he will also be printing shirts. I am just thinking, man, wouldn't it be nice if we could just have one big order of shirts instead of being petty? It would be cheaper for everyone if we could order with a larger volume. We could also chip in on a professional illustrator, get something really iconic. I posted a video I made on Facebook group chat to show off my portable DM kit I use. It's a nice little black case with encounter cards in it, nice compartment for dice, minis, and spell radius tiles. I was really proud of how it turned out, so I was excited to share it. He quickly deleted my post and said, Do you use this for your Tuesday night games? This group is for Wednesday. Tisk tisk tisk. He then suspends me, suspends me from his Facebook group, and he made his own Discord server and at everyone to the link before leaving my server. Only about four of my players joined, including myself. He shortly banned me from his server as well. I never made a single post there. Not sure what I did to piss this guy off so much, but live and let live, I guess? I'm not going to meet his pettiness with more pettiness. I am just going to do my stuff. I am sure it will continue to be successful. In less than one year, I have grown to a level it took him five years to achieve. Although this garbage is not a competition, the only win here is to make sure the players have a good time, as well as making sure the bar get some new customers. It would be really nice if we could have a cooperative relationship, and honestly, I don't hate the guy. I'm sure if he was not trying to be so much like me, we would probably be friends. We clearly have a lot in common. It's unfortunate that things are where they are, and I don't see things changing from his perspective. On multiple occasions, I have asked him to grab a beer sometime so we can talk these conflicts out. He has turned me down every time. Also, still never been to one of my one-shot tarot card games. 
Some people can get really petty when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, which is pretty silly considering that this is a game that we're playing for fun. That opening scenario though, where they killed the guy's pig, that was pretty mean-spirited to say the least. Sure, yeah, it's an imaginary game, but like the OP said, I mean, there is a degree of you need to think about how the players, the people at the table are making this decision. It's like an extension of that whole, it's what my character would do thing. Like, would your character really kill this innocent pig who has done nothing to you at all? Probably not, you're just doing it to be a dick. Good on the OP for realizing that this game is just not for them and creating their own games and running their own little community. That is really great. Of course, Gob had to shit on the whole thing himself, but it seems to have survived Gob's pettiness and I see it surviving Gob's pettiness for a good foreseeable future. I think the bulk of the problems here is just, I guess selfishness is the best word I can use for it. Gob clearly doesn't want the OP stealing his spotlight, which is definitely a damning thing. It is IRL main character syndrome at its finest. Content warning, an excessive amount of the word lesbian being used. You have been warned. So the RPG part of RPG horror stories isn't gonna happen, but it is still a horror story and it's happening right now. I currently have 11 DMs, not that kind, from the person waiting in my inbox that I'm honestly kind of afraid to open. Hopefully typing this out is going to make sense of what the hell is happening? So I'm currently playing a Vampire the Masquerade game with this person, having a blast, honestly. He said some slightly weird tone-deaf things in the past, but nothing that really blared alarms and sirens as anything other than, oh, this person is probably not part of an inclusive community and is probably still learning how to be inclusive, but he seems, you know, well-intentioned. Overall, I leave the sessions feeling great, and I feel comfortable speaking to this person and the other players outside of the sessions. Honestly, all I could ask for, but I'm not sure if that's going to be true now. So this person dropped a message in the server that he will be running a Mage the Ascension game, and anyone who is interested in playing should DM him a character concept. I'm excited, so I do. I want to play a mage who writes and creates songs and music videos about lesbianism and influences her art with her magic. It's not terribly deep or complex or original, but Becky's so hot just dropped a few weeks ago, and I enjoy my sapphic YouTube content because songs about girls loving girls just wasn't what it is now when I was discovering my sexuality. We adult lesbians had only I kissed a girl to cling on to. And I deeply admire them, both as art I consume and enjoy, and as progress that gives power of voice to people like me. I was going to have her awaken as a mage by discovering the power she imbues into her creations by putting her emotions into them. Any emotion, be that her sexuality or any other aspect of her life and her experiences. I am not a stranger to code switching or testing the waters with unfamiliar people to assess if it's safe to go full out rainbow glory, but for context, the Vampire the Masquerade game we are in was full of sex and sexuality with all NPCs being considered pansexual until proven otherwise. We were all encouraged to be our full sexy vampire selves, and it was a free space of racism, homophobia, sexism, etc. So I thought that we as players were on the same page with that. I dropped the bare bones, snappy character concept to the prospective mage storyteller hereafter known as the storyteller, singer-songwriter who writes and creates lesbian music slash music videos, fully prepared to use that as a jumping off point to really get into her as a character and what motivates her and start figuring out how she would fit into the story that the storyteller had in mind, because I hadn't really been given any chronicle concepts or starting story to tie my character into the world that the storyteller was creating at this point, I couldn't start to figure out why my character would be in the story anyway, only to get the response of, let me tell you straight. I have too many lesbians in my game. I'm sorry, I I just can't. I can't say that with a straight face, guys, okay? Come on. First of all, haha -ha pun. But second, what? Is there some sort of token quota that's already been filled with lesbian characters? Why, by that logic, do I never hear too many straights in my games? I'm thrown off kilter and trying to diffuse the situation as I figure out how to respond. I point out the pun with an intended to be non-threatening lol, but that does not pause the assault on my brain cells. He goes on to say that a lot of players want to play lesbian characters, and in his experience, they all do it badly, and he proceeds to tell me, a real-life lesbian, that lesbian characters tend to objectify real lesbians. I tell him I'm a lesbian, so why would I objectify myself? The exact details of the ensuing exchange elude me, mostly because my brain is trying to protect me from what is currently making my hand shake. 
but Storyteller reiterates that his point stands that lesbian characters stand to objectify real lesbians per his expectations. He tells me his adoptive mother is a lesbian. I still don't understand how that is relevant. It has I have black friends energy. He details his experience to me, which okay, but I am a lesbian who doesn't want to objectify myself or other lesbians. And why do I, a lesbian who acts as myself on a daily basis, need to know the details of other people playing lesbians badly? He said he didn't know I was lesbian. It's never come up. I told him that he didn't know if I was straight either. He said 90% of the population are. My hands start shaking at this point. I'm still hoping that I could still salvage this acquaintance, share my feelings with him, that I was hurt that he made assumptions about my sexuality that weren't true on his own biases and prejudices. I share with him that I've experienced being told I wasn't lesbian because I was this or that, and that I don't like that I'm barred from putting a part of myself as well as something that I like and admire, lesbian music and lesbian artists, into my character. He tells me that he's not here to handhold me and that I'm calling him a homophobic bigot. I've never accused him of that. I did say that he made assumptions of me based on his own biases and prejudices, but we all have biases and prejudices informed by the differences in how we live relative to one another. I told him that I never called him a homophobic bigot, whether or not someone else once called him one. He tells me that I just might as well say he's a homophobic bigot and that I'm being reactionary and defensive because of my past experiences. I say that it seems to me that he's being very reactionary and defensive himself right now, and I have 11 DMs from him in my inbox. There are two interpretations of the story, one of which is generous to the that guy in question, one of which is significantly less generous. Let's start with the first one. The first one being that this guy has had really bad experience with people playing lesbian characters, not lesbian people playing lesbian characters and being very objectifying and not being very great. And I would understand wanting to avoid stuff like that. However, again, the girl, the OP posting this is a lesbian woman who wants to play a lesbian woman in the game. Wanting to play a character like you should be just fine. I mean, if anything, that's the most comfortable thing for a lot of people. I play a lot of asexual characters because I am asexual myself. It just is more comfortable for me. So anyway, yeah, interpretation number one, he just reacted very badly and is just trying to stick to his guns until things can work out. We'll see how those 11 DMs turned out. Interpretation number two is this guy has a little bit of homophobia in there, which, you know, is not great. Him freaking out about her her respectfully telling him that her comment made her uncomfortable is just, it's a bit of a red flag for me, not great. I mean, if he does have a little bit of homophobia in there, then it'll be really awkward if he's telling the truth about the whole adoptive mother thing, but you know, he just might not be telling the truth, who knows? No matter what, the argument, I've had some bad experience with other people playing lesbian characters in the past, so you, an actual lesbian person, can't play one in my game. I think that that's, that's kind of dumb no matter how you shake it out. Of course, I do hope that it's interpretation number one. I hope that this is just miscommunication, and I really hope that this guy isn't homophobic. I pretty much always hope that that's the case with everybody. But you know, until we see those DMs, I guess we'll never find out. All right, and that's where we're going to end today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then subscribe to Crispy's Tavern, and keep an eye out. We've got a brand new series coming up pretty sure there's going to be a trailer on Sunday. Keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, if you want to leave your own stories and thoughts, you can go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. Too many what? To let me know you made it to the end of the video. That's it. Like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.